All right, so we're still talking about proteins. Uh, we've gone over primary structure, which were individual amino acids joined together with peptide bonds. Then we talked about secondary structure, which formed these alpha helices, and then also a zigzag beta sheet structure. And now we're up to tertiary structure, which is a, a complex three-dimensional folding that is uh, incredibly unique for every protein. Uh, it's really what gives each protein its function and unique characteristic is its shape. The shape is then dictated uh, by the types of bonds that form that create the shape and then hold that shape together. All right. So our tertiary structure is this third level of protein structure. Uh, there are bonds that are now going to occur between the R groups. So every amino acid is essentially the same except for the unique R group. In the past, the peptide bonds were between amino and carboxyl groups. In secondary structure, it was hydrogen bonds. Those were also between amino and carboxyl groups. Now we're into the third level, our tertiary level of structure, and the bond is between the R groups. All right. What kind of bonds though? This is what this squiggly picture over here is gonna uh, talk about here. The types of bonds we're going to see are going to be ionic, covalent, we're going to see uh, hydrogen bonds, and we're going to see something called nonpolar interactions. And these types of bonds are what are going to create and stabilize the three-dimensional structure of then a, a functional protein. So here we have uh, over here, uh, so look at this. So the little squiggly thing is representing a twisted, folded, alpha helical part of a protein uh, that now has just some highlighted R group sticking off it uh, where we can see how they might interact with each other. Uh, so, and these are just some examples. They're not the only, only kinds that can occur. So these are, this is an R group, okay, right here of a, an amino acid that would be somewhere here. Uh, and it's nonpolar. You can see it's carbons and hydrogens and, that, and that's all we have. And here's another one that's nonpolar. So there's no charge. They don't interact with water. They really don't interact with each other in a way that they're sharing electrons or, or attracted to charge. But because everything else around them, water, all the other molecules all have charge or polarity, they don't really like anything else. And, and the only thing that they'll can associate with uh, is each other. So this is a type of nonpolar interaction. And it is a highly stabilizing interaction because they really can't go anywhere else. So that that region is then held together because um, it's not pulled uh, in any other direction. Here we have one of the uh, R groups of an amino acid that would be the acidic R group. Sorry, this is the basic R group and here's the acidic R group. So this one's gonna have the, the negative charge uh, because it may have lost a proton. This one is a positive charge because it gained a proton. So there's going to be an attraction between um, the negative and the positive charge. They're going to pull each other together. That would form an ionic bond. So ionic bonds are going to be typically between uh, the acidic and basic R groups. And then we have a whole number of R groups that are polar. Right? So we have our groups that have you know, carbons and oxygens and oxygens and hydrogens, uh, and they're going to have partial, remember, partial negative and partial positive charges. Just like the ionic bond, you know, they're going to be attracted to each other. They're not fully ionized, um, but that's what we call the polar. Uh, these are polar covalent bonds, um, sorry, up in here. Uh, and then this bond here that we're making is the, the hydrogen bond. So because these are polar R groups, um, so these are the hydrogen bonds between the polar R groups, uh, we're going to see that. Some types of, um, of the R groups will tend to form covalent bonds with each other. One of the most common types of covalent bonds uh, that we'll see is a bond between um, these particular groups here. Uh, there are sulfhydryl groups that are found in the amino acid cysteine, and they form something called a disulfide bridge. 
A disulfide bridge is particularly strong and stabilizing for the three-dimensional structure of a protein. Uh, we'll tend to see many of these in uh, proteins that have to operate at higher temperatures, partially because as the temperature increases, the bonds may be broken. If the bonds are held together, if they're holding together the structure and they are ionic and hydrogen bonds that are individually weak bonds, then a slight raise in temperature could make the protein fall apart. Uh, the disulfide bridges, these covalent bonds right here, they are then going to uh, require a lot more energy to break and so they make the protein a lot more stable. Right. So we have the nonpolar interactions between the nonpolar R groups just kind of together almost by default in a way. Uh, we have the ionic bonds between the charged R groups. We have hydrogen bonds between polar R groups, and then we can have covalent bonds as well. And the covalent bonds, particularly these disulfide bridges, uh, are gonna be the strongest, most stabilizing force. Um, so tertiary structure, uh, again, defined as a complex three-dimensional folding. Now, some of this folding occurs spontaneously, meaning that it just kind of happens. You know, positive attracted to negative, these things get pulled together. But a lot of it is guided uh, by other molecules. So there are specific proteins called chaperone proteins, uh, also known as our HSPs or heat shock proteins. Uh, and they're proteins who uh, bind to the newly forming polypeptides as they're being made from a ribosome, and then they help guide and fold certain parts of the structures together so that they interact. Um, and then they create a very specific shape. If the protein doesn't have this specific shape, or if it loses the shape, it will lose its function. So the function of a protein and the shape of the protein are tied together. And it is the tertiary level of structure. It's this level. So here's the, the, the key thing here, is where we get function. So a peptide, a single, like a few amino acids together can have a function as a signal molecule, but typically they're not going to carry out chemical reactions. They're not going to guide molecules across membranes. They're not carrying out major activities in the cell. So primary structure in itself doesn't behave as a protein, as an enzyme, as an active transport pump. It's just a sequence of amino acids joined together and it doesn't really have a job. Secondary structure, we get the twisted helices and sheets, it adds more to it, still not functional, still can't do anything. It's only at this level, it's only once we reach this more complicated three-dimensional folding and the protein takes that shape that now it can interact with other molecules and it can bind to them, change them, move things, uh, move itself, it can act as a motor protein. Um, all the things that proteins do um, can now be done once it has this particular shape. Right, and that shape is established by the R groups. Okay, they're what dictate what type of shape is going to, um, to occur. And that's it.